Today is April the 18th, 2012. My name is Dr. Michael Berna, and I'm here today on behalf of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. It's a project that captures and archives the oral histories of the men and women who served in one or more of our nation's conflicts. We are in Manesson, Pennsylvania at the Manesson Heritage Museum today to interview Mrs. Beatrice Yakum, a veteran of the Women's Army Corps. Welcome, Ms. Yakum, and thank you for agreeing to share your military experiences with the rest of the nation. Ms. Yakum, let's begin uh, a little bit about your background. Uh, you were born in, in New York, if I understand uh, correctly. Oswego, New York. Actually, it was a little town called, I lived originally in what they called Scriba, a township, but it was in Oswego County, and I was born in the Oswego Hospital. Okay. Well, uh, May 7th, 1924. 1924. Okay, so soon to be your birthday. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And you came from a large family, I understand. I'm the oldest out of 11 children. There was nine girls and two boys. Out of them, all of the girls are still surviving. My brother, that was four years younger than I am, he went into service and he was stationed in Okinawa but he went in in peacetime, and uh, he passed away at the age of 70. The rest of us are all still surviving. Okay, and, and most of your family still in New York? All of them, they're there except my brother Kenny, who's the baby of the family. He was born after I was married, and uh, actually he's 47 years younger than I am. Oh my goodness, there's a few years in between there. Well, my sister Donna was three months old. She was born the 4th of June, 1944, and I went into service September of 1944. She was three months old. So she's 20 years, exactly 20 years younger than I am. And my brother Kenny, the baby of the family, he's seven years younger than her. Mm -hmm. So he's going to, he's, I think going to be 60 this year. Okay. And I will be 88 the 7th of May. Well, soon happy birthday, uh, early happy birthday to you. Thank you. Yes, and your family, what kind of work were they involved in? My father was a farmer all his life. We had a, he had a 67 acre farm and all of us girls had to be boys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I did the, the whole bit. I milked cows, I cleaned out cow barn, and then when it come to haying, I had to do the raking and then pitching the hay up under the hay wagon and then taking it up into the barn and then putting it up into the mow and then from the mow put mow a note away. And then when it come time for the hay to be fed to the cows, we had to go up and throw it down to go into the cows. So was it a dairy farm? Or my dad made all of his whole lifetime was on the milk. He never, he was a carpenter. I mean, he was a darn good carpenter. And he, uh, there was neighbors that, there was a neighbor man there that owned a number of houses and he wouldn't let anybody fix his houses except my dad. And my dad did a lot of remodeling on, he bought a, an old farmhouse and he did a lot of remodeling in that and he built his own cow barn, and uh, he died in 1974, and at the time he died, he was milking 18 cows. My goodness, my goodness. But all of, he raised all of us children just from the money that he got from the milk, mm -hmm. because he had Guernsey cows, and they all had a, a 4.6 cream content in their milk. So he was getting good money on that. But his milk was picked up every morning at 8 o'clock and shipped to New York City. Mm. And that's how that, uh, all the income was from that. Okay, well, he was a very successful farmer then. He knew what he oh, was yeah. doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, your, and so your mom was busy tending to all the kids in the household. Yeah, not so much my mom, us girls. Yeah, yeah. Everybody did something. Well, right? Mom, there was a new baby every two years. Right. right down the line. There's right. two years between all of us, three years between a couple of them, but right. there's two years between all of us. 
And us, Oswego has a kind of, it's a historic town, isn't it? Right now, the New York University is there. Is that right? New York State University. It was a normal college, normal school it was originally, because I have an aunt and an uncle that were my dad's sister and brother. They went to the normal school and they became school teachers. Okay. And so whenever they, uh, uh, they both taught in New Jersey. <clears throat> yeah, I can use it. <laughs> Sometimes the breakfast decides to come back up. <coughs> yeah, and uh, <coughs> at one time my aunt was even my school teacher. Is that right? <coughs> my dead sister. She died at the age of ninety-three. <coughs> oh, excuse me. She died at the age of 93. Yeah. And my dad's mom died at 95. <clears throat> and if my grandfather had lived until December the 5th, he would have been 100. Well, you have some good genes in your family. <laughs> Maybe you're still going to be around for quite a while. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what they tell me. Well, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Because my dad had uh, one uncle. One uncle that was 96, one, no, one, <clears throat> one brother that was 96, one brother that was 97, and he probably would have been still living, but he got hit by a car, killed him. <clears throat> my uncle Frank was 26, was 96. On my mother's side, he, she only had one sister that lived to be that age. Oh, <clears throat> but uh, the rest of them. All my dad's family lived to be in their 80s. Mm -hmm. So now you went you went to uh, high school in Oswego. And, uh, you obviously didn't have a lot of time to do anything but work on the farm and go to school, I would imagine. That's about it. <coughs> we went to school. Uh, we went to a one-room schoolhouse, which was right across the street from my grandmother's. <coughs> and... Uh, all of my dad's family, they went to the same school. In fact, I have a picture of it. <coughs> I can't figure out what happened. Um, my uncle Al was a superintendent of the school district, and he put my aunt Gerd in as a school teacher. So she taught, taught there for two years. <coughs> but we all went to that one-room schoolhouse to eighth grade, and then from eighth grade we went it straight into high school. Okay. I didn't. I had to go. I, I lacked a credit, so I had to go to junior high for one one year, <clears throat> and and then from there I went straight into high school. I went my full my full four years of high school, oh. <clears throat> but I needed. Uh, I had pleurisy, and I missed two weeks of school. <clears throat> and in missing that school, I was supposed to take the state regents. It was in January, and I couldn't take it. So I had to wait until June to take my state regent. When I took my state regents, I come up, the, the arithmetic was the one I had to take. And I got a 98.6 on it. Wow. <clears throat> I missed two prop, two questions on the whole test of having a perfect paper. I even got a commendation from the state of New York that I was the highest one in this whole state that took the regent. Well, good for you. Congratulations <laughs> for that. Yeah, my dad was good at arithmetic. He could figure it out in his head, but then he couldn't tell us how he did it. Yeah, but he knew. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we used to say, well, Dad, we, we can put the answer down, but how are we supposed to figure it out? He says, well, that's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> so you, then you graduated from high school, and then... I really didn't graduate because I needed an extra, uh, an extra credit. Okay. But I did go my full four years. Okay. <clears throat> and then after high school, <laughs> what? After high school, I went to work at jobs doing housework or taking care of kids. 
and then from there I had a number of jobs. I moved into the city to live with my aunt because my dad wasn't able to take me back and forth for traffic. <clears throat> so when I lived with my aunt, I started out first at the the uh, Oswego Hospital, and I worked down in the kitchen helping the cooks. From there, I went to, to uh, well, I guess you would call it a deli store, and I worked there. And from there, I went into the diamond match factory, and I was working at the diamond match factory. We had uh, a machine that took the little penny pack, little penny packages of matches, and wrapped them up in a bigger wrapper. And then we had to take those and put twelve in a package, and wrap it again mm. and, and pack it. And I was working there. I never told anybody that I was going into the service. I didn't even tell my parents. I didn't tell them at work. I just was having some problems with a married man at work. And he said, oh, I don't live with my wife, he said. And I had to work till 11 o'clock at night. And he would be waiting there to walk me home. And no matter how many times I told him to stay the heck away from me, you know, because I wasn't that type of a girl. And so I just got to the point I said, this is it, I'm getting out. So I quit my job. I, <laughs> I didn't even quit my job. I was still working to the day I went into service. And if it hadn't been for my mother, they wouldn't have even known then that I had listed. But my orders came into my, to the house, into my mother's, into my home. And my mother called down there and she said, tell my daughter her orders came in for her to go into the service. Is that right? So the manager came in and he says to me, what's this I hear? And I said, I don't know, what did you hear? And he says, you're leaving us. And I said, uh, yes, I've enlisted in the service. And it just one afternoon, I just called my sister Evelyn, and I said, Ev, go to Syracuse, New York with me. I'm going to enlist in the service. I, had just, I turned 20 in May, and in September is when I went into the service. And, and you, so you went to Syracuse to enlist? Yeah, Syracuse, okay. New York. Okay. Because I had to have my mom and dad's permission. My dad signed without any problem, but, but my mom started in that, oh yeah, you're going into service because of all the boys, that, that's all you think about, your boy crazy, and a few other choice things, and I said, yes, I'm leaving. So I went into service. She at first refused to sign, and I said, that's fine, I've lived with Aunt Liz for almost four years, I said, she'll sign as my guardian. And my dad got mad, he said, you'll sign that paper and I don't want another word out of you. So she signed the paper, and uh, I had it authorized, and I went into service. And I left on September. We were supposed to have two weeks, myself and another girl from Oswego, but we didn't have the two weeks because they needed two girls to fill up the shipment that was leaving Syracuse because we traveled at night. And we traveled from from there into... I think Ohio was, was the first place we went, the state of Ohio, because we traveled at night. We had sleeper cars, and we traveled at night, and we landed in Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. And the crazy part is in Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, Chattanooga, Tennessee is on this side, and in Oglethorpe, Georgia, they divide right in the middle of the street. <laughs> So if you went on that side, you were in Tennessee, and if you were on this side, you were in Georgia. My goodness, I didn't know it was that close. Yeah, <laughs> Not, neither did we. Yeah. <laughs> so whenever we, whenever we had wanted to leave the base, we had to go and either stay on this side for Oglethorpe, or we were allowed on this side to Tennessee. And so when you got to Oglethorpe, what was your first impression? <sighs> well. We really didn't have too much time to make an impression because the very first morning they had us up, <laughs> they had us up ready to march in formation to go to our uh, breakfast. Mm -hmm. We had march in formation to go to breakfast. 
we had just so much time to go to breakfast. And then from breakfast, in fact, I'll tell you my breakfast was, <clears throat> no, it was dinner that was the, my problem. Um, being born and raised on a farm, we had most all of our vegetables. Well, we had never had turnips on our bit. <laughs> and they give us mashed turnips on the on our dinner tray. Well, it looks like mashed potatoes. And they, when we went down the line, they everything went on the tray. So I went back and I took one mouthful of it, and I, well, I had put my hand up like that. I started to gag so fast from it because I'd never had it. And I said, I can't eat that. I'm going to be sick. I can't eat it. So when I went out, I left it on my tray. And there was a woman, an officer standing there. She says, you can't leave your tray with food on it. And I said, ma'am, I can't eat it because I'll be sick. She said, you have to clean the tray. So I went back and I went to the napkin holder, took two napkins out wrapped the turnips up in the napkin, and went back out through the line and threw it in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> never did to like develop that taste I never, I, to this day, I cannot eat a turnip. <laughs> well, that, that was some introduction to, uh, to Fort Oglethorpe. Well, what makes me laugh is, you know, down at the library, some of the... Um, uh, one of the guys that's down there, he was starting to talk to me about the things that we raised on the farm. So I said to him, did you ever hear a vegetable oyster? And he looked at me, he said, what's a vegetable oyster? I said, it looks like a radish, but it tastes like an oyster. And you raise it in a garden like you would a radishes. He's never heard of it, never heard of it. <laughs> I said, well, my dad raised them, so I said we had oysters, whether there was an hour in the mo in the month or not. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't matter. No. Didn't matter. We we had white radishes, we had red radishes, we had our beets, we had our onions. My dad navy bean. My da dad was a navy bean. Every Sunday, it had to be a dish of navy beans, and uh, they put them to soak on Saturday night boil them up on Sunday till they start to get soft. Then he would take them out, put them in a casserole, put butter over the top of them, slap them in the oven. And on Monday, he'd make himself a sandwich of baked beans for lunch. He and liked those beans. <laughs> my dad could never eat sugar from the time he was born. Hmm. There was three, three of them in his family that were born that way. My uncle, Ma my uncle Ed, my uncle Frank, and my dad. Okay. No, my uncle Dick was the same way. There was four of them. Okay. And uh, because he kept getting sick, and and the doctor said, my grandmother's name was Olivia, and the doctor said, Olivia, I think you got another one of those boys. He says, you can't give him sugar. So he lived on nothing but Italian bread. Hmm. Never ate sliced bread of any kind. No more. And he, if my mom, we all had our own chickens. My mom made custard. She had to make one without sugar for my dad, and then one with sugar for us kids. <laughs> so, B, let's go back to uh, uh, Oglethorpe. So, okay, after your first experience. We had to take 10 weeks. We had 10 weeks tra training. Okay. Okay, in the morning, we as soon as we went to breakfast, we had to go clean up our area, make our bed, and make sure that your bed was tight enough so that the, they could bounce a quarter on your bed, or else you got a gig. And what's a gig? A gig was a mark against you, so that you had to make sure that you did it right, okay. or else you had to do some kind of a performance. Okay. And it was a mark against you. And and was your was your superior officer very demanding? No. No. And on Saturday afternoon, we had we Saturday afternoon we were all put in formation. We had to march to the infirmary and get all the doggone shots. Mm -hmm. And you, you got two or three at the same time. Well, I at the time I went to school, they didn't have to have the vaccination for smallpox, 
So when I was vaccinated, being that my skin is so sensitive, they did it too deep, and I got a lump under my arm from it. Oh, wow. So I, got, I still have a, sca a scar. <coughs> After and, all these years? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I had to go on sick call because of the lump under my arm because I, I couldn't because I had to leave the sleeve off of my uniform huh? to let the air get to that. They took the scab off. It scabbed on the outside instead of healing from inside out, which it was supposed to do. So I had to take my sleeve off and sit in the lounge in the quarters for that to, to heal. And I was three days on sick call like that until she said I could go back. Okay. And, 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 w and your training, I mean, you had worked on a farm, so how did you think your training was compared to farm work? In the morning, it was all schools. We had to march in formation. <laughs> and this is another part that, that caused me trouble because I got short legs. <laughs> and they lined us up four in a row. And I was always on the outside. So whenever we had to go around, when, whenever we come up in a line, you come up like this, and then you had to pivot around like this to go. Well, being that I was on the outside, I always had to run to catch up with, with, my, with, my, <laughs> with my four that I was standing in line with. Right. And you marched in formation. That's the way you marched all morning. You went to classes. Then in the afternoon, as soon as you had your lunch, you went to calisthenics, PT they called it. Yeah. And we spent an hour doing exercises, and then you went back to the dorm and you had a rest period. Then you were in formation again to to go go for mail call, and then for mail call you went to your supper, and your supper was at five at four thirty to five, <clears throat> and you had to make sure that your plate was cleaned up, and then you go in line, and then you couldn't go back, and you were finished then. The rest of your time was yours. And, and what would you do with your time? Generally, I spent it either writing letters or walking to the PX because there was a lot of, whenever we were in basics, it was all right because all of us girls ate together. But when, when we got out onto the field, it was girls and boys together yeah. in the mess hall. And I had a problem with that. So they had a civilian mess hall there, a civilian, like a civilian restaurant. And I always went there and got what I wanted to eat because I couldn't eat all of the stuff that they had in the mess hall because I'm not a heavy eater. You know, being on the farm, you're meat and potato and vegetable and that's it. You didn't have a salad. You didn't have cake after every meal and dessert and all that stuff. Right. <clears throat> and I was used to eating that way. So I would go to the PX and I would get maybe a cent of uh, ice cream or something. Mm -hmm. And then I, my part was I was always going for milkshakes. Oh. <laughs> what flavor? Vanilla. Vanilla. Because if my stomach got a little bit mixed up, I could take a vanilla milkshake and it would settle it. Mm-hmm. And then we would go back to the mess hall, and it was take your bath and get your clothes lined up for the next morning. Okay. Because usually first thing in the next morning, they caught us to do exercises in the ba in the dorm before you went to class. Mm. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> believe me, you got plenty of exercises. Now, did, did the 10 weeks go fast for you, or did it seem oh, like yeah. it, it went pretty quickly? Yeah, it went fast. Yeah, we, uh, we got there in September, and actually uh, my basic started September 17th, okay. 1944. And then from there, uh, Thanksgiving Day, we, we were put on a train. We were finished our training, and Thanksgiving Day we were sent out to whatever station we were going to. And my first station was... Fort Slocum, New York. Fort Slocum, New York. Well, we landed in Grand Central Station in New York, and then we had to get on another train to take us to Fort Slocum, because Fort Slocum was an island outside of New Rochelle, New York. Mm -hmm. 
which is outside of New York City. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we, the only trans, the only way you could go back and forth was by boat. Mm -hmm. So we went there, and uh, I was working in the post office. Uh, first, they started me in the hospital, in the female ward. Well, there was a sergeant in there. There was a son of a gun, and she wouldn't. I had to go down stairs to make up her tray to bring it up for breakfast. Mm. And she wasn't satisfied what I was bringing it. And after I got the tray thrown at me for three days, I went in and I told him I need a transfer. I can't take this anymore. Mm. So I was put in the post office. And being <laughs> Fort Slocum was only about two miles around the island, <laughs> I worked in the post office and then I had to go I had to go and collect the mail from the boxes as they were stationed around the island to bring it back into the post office to get it ready to be shipped into New York City. And you walked around? You, uh, you walked oh, around. it was all walk. Yeah. It was all walk. How long did that take you to, to finish your tour? About 45 minutes. Okay. Because like I said, it wasn't that big. Okay. And there was only about five boxes that I had to pick up. Okay. One was in front of the the, the general's off house, the main part, part. And one was by the, uh, it was YMCA actually, but it was, the uh, PX was downstairs. And uh, they, at that time they had uh, brought in prisoners. And they were st they were allowed to go out. They weren't the violent type, but they were allowed to mingle with the you know the rest of them. Mm -hmm. And they used to gr bring civilians from the mainland, and to uh, with and they'd make homemade cookies and that, and they would serve it to the boys. Mm -hmm. They would go there and write letters or shoot pool or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would go down there sometimes and spend time down there. And I had to laugh because they had a tennis court there. I didn't play tennis, but my Uncle Dick had a tennis court, so I was used to batting the ball back and forth. Well, anyway, they flooded it in the winter time and made a skating pond out of it. So I sent, home, called, t uh, sent a letter to my mother. I said, send me my skates. I'm by myself down there skating around on that skating park. I think I was the only one that ever used it. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, so you had learned to skate when you were growing up. You know why? Because my dad and my uncle, there was a little stream that come down through my a piece of, prop of my dad's property. Mm -hmm. And it come down through and it flooded the flat, what they called the flat, but it was my dad's pasture. So they built a little dam there and backed the water up. So in the winter time, we had a great big skating park, probably about the size of a football field. Wow, wow. And um, it would be flooded, and my dad would keep testing the ice and everything. So it, the city didn't have any skating pond or any, so <laughs> everybody from the city, they were coming <laughs> using our skating pond. Yeah. And... Uh, we would go down there. At night we would go down through the cornfield, down into where the skating pond was, put on our skates and skate. Okay. So you were you were ready when Oh yeah. When it when it was there. Well my uncle Dick, God love him. He said, I'm gonna buy you skates. He said, But they're trainer skates. Okay, they were built like this. They had two runners here and two runners here they met here and you strapped them on your shoes and once you learn to skate on those for balance he said then I'll buy you shoe skates so we skated on those until we learned our balance and how to skate and everything and then for Christmas he brought my brother Bob my sister Evelyn and myself shoe skates oh wow so we went down skating every chance we had a <laughs> dad would make you go down and just the the pond to make sure it was solid enough to hold us, and we would go down. He, and 
Believe me, New York State got snow. <laughs> oh, uh, well, Oswego is, is known for uh, snow in, uh, because of the lake effect there, is that right? Right. They get uh, hundreds of inches a year there. Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, <laughs> in fact, after I got married and came here, my mother wrote me a letter and she said, you're not going to believe this. And starting on Thursday dinner time, my dad heard it on the radio. He said, we're in for some snow. It started snowing. They went Thursday morning and stocked up on groceries. Of course, we had our own milk. We had our own eggs. We had all of our own potatoes, all of our own apples, all of our popcorn, because my dad raised red popcorn. Okay. We had all of our, our beets and our cabbage and our pickles, and my mother would always can pears and blackberries and cherries peaches and we had all of our own jelly because us kids had to go pick the blackberries and go through the fields and pick all the blackberries so we had and strawberries and we had all that stuff canned so we always had plenty of canned stuff and my dad would butcher a cow and they would can the milk uh, can the meat so we had canned meat for, for beef well, my mother just had to boil up potatoes and open a quart jar of meat and make the gravy and we had meat and potatoes mm -hmm. we had it all winter mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh and like i said they had raised their strawberries so we always had strawberries and mom would can't beat dad always made the pickles and we always had our apples and we always had our popcorn because as kids used to come from school go down and sell or grab an apple make a pop or a corn on the old pot belly stove because we didn't have a furnace at that time. Right. Pot belly stove, we'd make a popper corn. As soon as we come from school at four o'clock, we'd go have our apple and our popcorn. <laughs> By supper time, we weren't hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so we had that, and then from from that, we uh, then when I I was learning to drive, I learned to drive a car when I was 16 and my dad fixed a track down by the potato field for me to learn to drive but I didn't know that he could watch me from the barn because he could watch out the barn window when he was milking to make sure that I was driving so I had usually about three or the four of the younger kids in the car with me and <laughs> take a pail and go dig mom but but potatoes because she needs potatoes so i would have to go down and dig potatoes and the kids would help me and then i would get in the car and drive around for a while so that dad could see that i was driving practice how to drive in between two park in between two rocks <laughs> without hitting them and all that stuff and that's how i learned to drive oh my goodness. we had a my dad had a Ford, a 1940 Ford Model A, and that's what I learned to drive on, with oh. a stick shift in the middle. <laughs> well, that once you learn that, it's like learning <laughs> on the skates. When you when you were what, so when you were in Fort Slocum then, uh, and you were working in the postal department then, you yeah. said right? Yeah, I was. And, and so what was what was it life like on there as far as the military life? Were you said now that there were men and women there at Fort Slocum? Yeah, we were. They were all of all of the bases I was at. Were uh, double. And, and so, what was was there a feeling? I know not long before that there was a feeling about women coming into the military, and and as a whack, uh, you were the first military first women who had equal military pay, and benefits. And I know there was a little bit of a time period when that changed from the WAAC to the WAC. By the time I went in, it was WAC. Okay. The WAAC had gone out uh, the year before. Right, okay. And then it changed to the WAC. So wh how was the feeling, though, among the men and the women? Did they, did they look down on Not you? Not too good. Not too good. The, the, boys, the boys could be very insulting when they wanted to be. Okay. Because I had more than one say, oh, you're the one that took my place so that I could get sent overseas to get shot at. Oh, is that what the feeling Oh, yeah. Was? And if we were walking, we had to watch how we walked. 
because if we walked too fast so that we were shaken up here, they would say, shake it, but don't break it, shake it, but don't break it. And I was called on that a couple of times. But the officer see what was going on because I was leaving from where I lived, from where my base, what my barracks was, I had to walk through a parade ground into another street that took me up around to where I, where our barracks were because the barracks, the women's barracks were in a separate part of the post altogether. They weren't near the men. Okay. And uh, I was walking across there. I was walking by myself and I was walking kind of fast. And these guys that were in, they were supposed, they were in parade rest actually when they were marching. And uh, they started making these comments, whistling and stuff like that. So their officer put them into attention. So once they're in attention, they can't turn their heads to make any kind of comments or anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know they got chewed out, but uh, that's the way they, some of the remarks were. But there was more than one that that held it against uh, mm -hmm. because, see, in World War II, any woman that joined was volunteer, right? Unless she was an, a nurse or a clerical, a secretary to a private officer. Mm -hmm. So that all the other ones that went in as volunteers, we were open to criticism. Right, right. And and when, when the women were together, how did you talk about this and discuss it? How did you manage to to kind of make deal with it? Well, we didn't really, if there was a group of us together, they usually didn't bother us. But if we were one or two by ourselves, that's when we got the comments. So would you make it a point to travel in groups as often we, as possible? We, we generally did. Okay. okay. And see, there, I spent a lot of time because they had, a, from where our barracks was, there was a field house, what they call a field house, and they used to have basketball games down there. Mm -hmm. So I used to go down there and watch the basketball games. Mm -hmm. And then from there... Uh, two or three of us girls would get on the bus because they had a bus that run around the camp all the time to take you wherever you wanted. And we would get the bus and we would go down to the nun. At that time I was a corporal. And from, the, from there we would go down to the NCO club, non-officers club. And we would go down there and get sandwiches sometimes that the girls would want sandwiches back at the base. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they used to make delicious toasted cheese sandwiches down there. <laughs> so we would go down there and get toasted cheese sandwiches and get the bus and take it back up to the barracks. Ah, okay, so that got you through. Yeah. Everybody had those toasted yeah, anybody, cheese. Yeah, anybody that, you know, didn't eat too much supper and they wanted something to eat, they would go down there and get a sandwich. Right, right. Now, now, Fort Slocum, uh, it's it's a small island, right? Yeah. It's, it's, you said it's two miles around, not very not very no. big at all. <laughs> so you probably pretty much saw the same people all the time when oh, you yeah. were there, and especially being in the postal yeah. area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I got to know a lot of the a lot of the. They had a we had our theater. We had our theater and uh, the PX, and like I said, the field house. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had, uh, there was a, uh, and like I said, where the PEX was, they, they had a uh, tennis court, anybody that wanted to play tennis there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They had a, a football field, too, that they could play. And when we did our calisthenics, it was out in an open field. Okay. It was right off of our, because like I said, our quarters were separate. And they had bowling alleys and theaters there? Oh, yeah, they had all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they used to bring in busloads of civilian girls and have dances. Oh, okay. For, for anybody, you know, that wanted to go dances. Okay, so life was pretty normal on oh, the Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. We had, yeah, we had the latest movies and all that stuff. Uh-huh. And, and you were able to, mail was to be able to send free if you were in the military, is that right? Yeah. And did you just mark free in the upper right-hand corner? No, you put a stamp on it, but the stamp had it on it. Oh, okay. That it was free. 
Okay. And, and so you were you were there for how long out of your period in, in the military? I went in the mil I went in in September and I was transferred. I think it was the end of September, at the end of February. I was transferred from Fort Slocum to Camp Upton, which was out on Long Island near Patchogue. Okay. And, and that was a receiving hospital for veterans coming back from oh. the war because I was at Fort Slocum when the war was over in 45. Okay. And all the guys come up and they grab the women and kissing us and dancing around and everything. How did how how was that announced the end of the war? Over the loudspeaker for the whole base to hear. Just like that. I bet the place went crazy. Oh, it did. It did. The guys come running up to the girl up to where the wax were at our quarters, or if if they were in an office working together, they would grab them and kiss them and everything. And what did you think about the war being over? I was glad, although I didn't know what I was. But see, I was married already. I mean, I was still in the service. I had because I had signed up for two years, and I was still in service. And uh, my husband and I, we got married. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I, we didn't say anything to anybody about getting married. And t it, it, he come and picked me up at lunchtime at the post office and went up to the hospital and got our blood work. And that's how they found out that I was getting blood work. And from there, then they say, oh, B's getting married. Not me, I just needed my blood tested because I'm anemic <laughs> and I was anemic at the, t at the time and I was five foot tall I mean I was not five foot tall I was a quarter of an inch from being five foot but they wouldn't put it down that way they put down that I was five foot <laughs> and I weighed 116 pound wow wow so then so <laughs> you were um, uh, I'm sorry um, when the war was over. I wasn't working in post office when the war was over. You were already uh, at Upton? Yeah. And, and uh, uh, did you request that transfer to Upton or did they just no, you they transferred, needed you there? They're tra you transfer every so often, they transfer you. Okay. Because the post office, Upton was, uh, Upton was a, a Camp Slocum, Fort Slocum, was a station where the boys went they went to school, take schooling or uh, of different types. Okay. And then from there, they were sent to their over, their base to be uh, sent overseas. Okay, so it was a training. It was training a training. Facility. Yeah, it was uh -huh. a training facility for any bo any of the younger boys. Okay. But but uh, Upton was different. Upton was a receiving station for boys coming back. It was a receiving. I gave Danny a book. To, that you could show it shows you all of Camp Upton, what everything was in it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so that he could put it down here if he wanted it, so they could get an idea of what the post was like. Now, did you have any experience doing nursing work when you went there, and what was that like for you? The only thing I did, well, they showed me the only thing I had to do. They didn't have any real serious cases at, at the hospital that I was in at Fort Slocum. All I had to do was take their temperature and read their pulse and make sure that they took their medicine and their meals. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing that I had to do. Mm -hmm. But like I said, this one woman, she thought she was a, she was a sergeant. But they had trouble with it. I understand from a lot of the from another base that she was on, and she was sent there. Um, she had yellow Jonas, and the other woman that was in there was an older woman. And she was a sweet, she was a, she was a widow, and she came in. And like I said, it was all volunteer, but you had to be under a certain age in order to volunteer. You had to be at least 20 before you could volunteer. Right. And I think you had to be, you had to be under, under 35 when you come in. Okay. And then from, uh, so that's the only thing. And 
In fact, I'm soft-hearted to start in with. And when I went downstairs into the kitchen, the cafe where the, the he went where they went for their trays, this boy came in. He had crutches under both arms, and he's trying to maneuver a tray to get back to the table to eat. And I dropped the tray, set the tray that I was supposed to be taking upstairs. I set it down on the table, and I went. I carried his tray back to the table, and I got chewed out by the nurse. Why? Because I wasn't supposed to help him. He was supposed to learn how to maneuver himself with the crutches and the tray. Ah. And if I did it for him, then he wouldn't learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, he was real thankful. He, thank you, thank you. He was telling me like that, but the nurse told me, she said, that's a no-no. She mm -hmm. said, you don't help him. Mm -hmm. And I said, ma'am, how was he supposed to carry that tray with crutches under his arms? Mm -hmm. She said, he has to learn to maneuver because he's going to have to go home that way. Mm -hmm. So did you spend all of your time there working with the wounded then? No. No? Well, primarily I would say yes because... Whenever I got transferred, when I got to, to Fort Sook, to Camp Upton, that it was starting to taper off, the mail and everything. Because, see, what I had to do was packages that were coming in, and if a boy was moved from one station to another, I had to readdress the package to mail it to him wherever he was because all of the temporary records were kept at Fort Slocum, okay. I mean at Camp Upton. Okay. And at Camp Upton, they had a whole room. It was just all temporary records of all the boys, because if they come back and they didn't have their original records from being tra transferred from wherever they were transferred, they made up a uh, temporary one, and it was kept on file. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would have to go look them up mm -hmm. to see what the record was. And what I did there was I worked under a sergeant, <coughs> staff sergeant. And I they were sending letters in to me, questionnaires in to me. Like why, did, why was I deducted this amount of money and why was I deducted this? What was it for? Well, you were deducted. If you lost your rifle, you were deducted for it. If you lost a, 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 anything from your uh, uniform, you were deducted for it. If you didn't come back, say you were on a furlough and you were allowed 15 days, you were from the time you sh your furlough starts from the time you're checked out to the time that you're required to be back, and it's all on your brick on your plate but if you don't if you're even 15 minutes past that date you're counted as a wall hmm. and if you're not so when you're a wall you don't get paid comp your your pen your uh, be, uh, your benefit your you get paid for going on for you leave what they call leave mm -hmm. and you if you're not that. yeah and if you're not back after that at that time even 15 minutes, even five minutes late, unless you call in advance through the Red Cross for an emergency to say that you can't be back at that time, you're counted as AWOL. Mm. And if you're AWOL, you don't get paid for your, for your furlough. Okay, so your responsibility is to help these people understand. Yeah, why they didn't get paid. And see, when you were on combat, as, as long as you were overseas, you were it was committed you were committed as combat and that you got extra pay for being combat but if you were just on the ba on the state side you didn't get combat pay and you got so much extra for combat pay okay okay I, I want to back up a little bit you were talking about uh, getting married and so uh, did you meet your husband in the service I met my husband yeah George returned from overseas. Okay. Uh, he was driving the colonel. Okay. From where our base, where our barracks was, we had to go down a, a, cro a crossroad and pass the colonel's house. 
So he was parked out there in front of the colonel's house every morning, waiting for the colonel to come out. So he started asking the girls at the base who I was, what my name was, and was I seeing anybody, or was I engaged, or any of that stuff. And they said, why don't you ask him your... <laughs> when they started ask, telling me about it, they said, I said, why don't you tell him to ask me himself? Well, this one night we had gone to the base, the ba uh, basketball game. We went down to the NCO club, and he comes in with an ambulance to pick up sandwiches, take for back where he was, because he and another driver had 24 hours on, 24 hours off. There was two drivers, the colonel. And if the colonel was in the car, the license num plate had to be uncovered. If he wasn't in the car, it had to be covered. So whenever they passed anybody on the street with the colonel's sign being uncovered, you had to salute the car. Oh. If it was covered, you didn't salute the car. Okay. So he had to drive the colonel from his, the general office, the main headquarters, was up above where our wax barracks were. So he had to go past our place four times a day, mm -hmm. or, f or 15 times a day, it didn't matter. So anyway, he started leaving the car uncovered, so that whether the colonel was in it or not, we couldn't see, because he always rode in the back seat, so we would have to salute the darn car. <laughs> so he, whenever he asked the girl, well then he come in that night, and I was down there picking up sandwiches to take back to the barracks with another girl. And they said, hey, B, there's the guy that wants to meet you. And I said, what, what are you talking about? They said, there's the one that's asking all the questions about you. So they brought him over and introduced us. So another guy comes in with an ambulance and he says, let me take the ambulance to take the girls back to the barracks because they got a hot sandwiches. So I was in a skirt, my dress, regular uniform. The girl that was with me was in her fatigues. So we, being in an ambulance, we weren't allowed to ride in the front seat, so we had to sit in the back on the benches. So when it come time to get out, of the ambulance, I'm in a fix because I can't climb over the front seat because I got a skirt on. The other girl, she could climb over the front seat because she had pants on. Mm -hmm. So she climbs out that way and gets out. And he comes around and I said, come on, open the door. I got to go scrub my area because we have inspection in the morning. He says, I'm not opening the door. I said, come on, don't be funny. I have to go get my quarters ready or else I'll get a gig. He said, nope. He said, the only way I'll open it is that you agree to go on a date with me. And I'm thinking, geez, I don't even know the guy. I just inter just got introduced to him. <laughs> Do I take a chance on going out with a date with him or not? Because I don't know nothing about him. And I said, okay. He said, we're going in and have something, have dinner, and then we're going to take in a movie. I said, okay. And that's when we started dating, and that was before Christmas. It was just before I was going to go on my 15, I had a 15-day furlough to go home for Christmas. And I met him just like the 15th of December. And I went, went, home, for the, went home for the furlough, and my, we decided there's a a group of trees up in back of the neighbor that lives across from this. We always went up there to get our Christmas tree. So my brother and I, we decided to go up after the Christmas tree. Well, my sneaky little brother, he decides to climb a stone wall. We had gotten a heavy snow. And I've got on my fatigue pants, because I didn't have a snow suit at the time. Got on my fatigue pants. We go over the stone wall, and it's piled up even 
quickly the snow pile. And I step off the stone wall and I go clear up to my waistline in the snow. Oh. And I said to my brother, oh, you sneak. <laughs> he said, I didn't know that snow was piled up like that. Because <laughs> he hadn't gone over yet. And of course, he was lighter than me to start in with. And he was smaller than me, too. I said, you sneak. I said, you knew I was going to do that. He said, no, I didn't. <laughs> So I started pelting him with snowballs. <laughs> and we go down home and my mother looks at me. She says, well, how, do you, how come you're all wet? I said, because Bob took me over a stone wall fence and I fell in the snow bank. <laughs> but, but we got our Christmas tree. <laughs> you got your Christmas tree. And then you went back after Christmas, furlough. Yeah, I went back for a furlough after Christmas. And uh, I met him, and we started dating right then and there. Okay. Almost every night. If, if we didn't go into town, he would pick me up. And we'd go down and sit in, in the motor pool office and just talk. And, to, and uh, he rode home and told his mother that he had met an English girl because he was Russian. And uh, she had her daughter write a letter back. You forget about that English girl. You don't need no English girl. You come home and marry a nice Russian girl from your own church. And he told his sister, he wrote a sister a letter back. He said, you tell mom, I will not forget her. If I don't marry her, I will not marry at all because I will not marry a Russian girl. Hmm. So we got married. We went and got our blood test and we got married on May 31st at 8 o'clock at night. We didn't get married on the base. We went into Riverhead, New York, which is an out, outside of where Patchogue is, mm -hmm. outside of where the base was. And I didn't know it at the time because my neighbor had a daughter that lived in Riverhead. And if I could, if I had called her, she would have arranged for my getting married at her place. Okay. So we got married by a Methodist minister. He's orthodox. And, of course, as soon as we come here, his mother started in. you got to be married in an orthodox church, and blah, 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 blah. And uh, he said, I am married, period. And he said, I will not get married again. But then we adopted a little girl 13 years after we were married. Hmm. And uh, we went and got married in the... Orthodox Church. Oh, nice. What a nice story. And from there, yeah, his sister was an Orthodox, was one of our witnesses. And then when her dad took his stroke and I took care of his dad, her dad, from 1976 until he passed away in 79. Oh, my. Uh, she had nerve enough to tell. My husband, I hadn't been home in almost seven years. And my father, my family was still all in New York, so he wanted to take me home because, like I said, I was taking care of the father-in-law 24 hours a day. Right. And he said, I think it's time that I took B home. And his sister said, yeah, maybe you better take her home because maybe you're not even married to her. Hmm. And he took off his shoe and threw it at her and hit, missed her and he put a hole in the kitchen wall. <laughs> <laughs> We threw it pretty hard then. <laughs> he, he did all right. And he said, I'll tell you right now, he said, either you come and take care of him, he said, or I'll go out and lock the door and he'll be here by himself and you can live with it. Mm -hmm. So the sister-in-law, one sister-in-law lived right across the street from us and she would come over and sit with Pep a couple hours at night. Mm -hmm. But she was working at the Shell Reminiscent Hospital in the laundry room. Okay. And she had a, a Ronnie. Now, you're, <coughs> excuse me, once you got married, though, that was your ticket out of the service, right? Because you couldn't yeah. be married in the service. Yeah. He was due to be, he was, be, he was due to be discharged. <coughs> he was due to be discharged the end of June. So as soon as I got married, I was sent on the 12th of June to be discharged. Okay, okay. 
So in, in if you look back on I got sent to Fort Dix. We we all got discharged in Fort Dix. Fort Dix? Yeah. Okay. Fort Dix, New Jersey. Okay. And as soon as I was discharged, I went back and spent a week with him on the base. I got a room in town because I couldn't stay on the base. I could go on the base as long as I was in uniform. Right. But I couldn't stay there. Mm. So I got a room. He paid for it in the town. And I stayed there. And then uh, I went home and I stayed with my parents until he got discharged. Mm. And uh, he got discharged on a Sunday. Well, I, apparently he got home on a Friday. He came back here, but he had ants in his pants, as his mother says. He kept going from back and forth. He would sit at the house for a while, and then he would go on the corner to talk to his buddies. And then he would come back. He bought himself two, two civilian suits. And uh, he says, I can't stand it any longer. I'm going after my wife. So he came to New York to my house. And we stayed there the month of July, the whole month of July. And he came <laughs> he came on a Sunday on a Sunday morning. He arrived in in at our place. He took a cab because he knew how to get out there. He took a cab and uh my sister Sally walked with him. I was up to my uncle Chet's picking strawberries. And my two aunts, they had just asked, and my uncle, they had just asked me, when are we going to meet the other half? I said, I don't know. I haven't heard from him. I don't know whether he's still, you know, in sur at base or whether he's out or what. And my sister Sally walks up and she says, get out of here. I'm taking your place. And I said, you are not. I got my carrier almost finished. I said, I'm finishing filling my carrier so I get paid for it because we got paid for him, the carrier. He had four quart baskets in mm -hmm. a carrier. And she said, I don't think so. And I said, oh, yes, I am. And uh, I said, what are you doing up here anyway? You were supposed to come up when we did, and you wouldn't come. So I said, what are you doing up here now trying to take my place? And she said, well, there's, there's a reason why you have to go. And I turned around, and here's my husband standing beside me. Oh, my. So my Uncle Chet says, well, I take this, take it, this is the other half. I turned around and I looked and I said, yeah, Uncle Chet, this is my husband. And so Sally took my place to finish picking strawberries and I walked that back down home, supposed to make breakfast for my husband because he hadn't had breakfast yet. Mm -hmm. And of course, we had a coal stove at that time, wood stove, I should say, the old-fashioned type. My mother never could keep a fire going. My dad used to get mad at her. He'd build the fire, and she'd let it go out. So anyway, uh, I went down, and I made him breakfast, and then we stayed there for the month of July. And I arrived, arrived here in Manesson, in the middle of a thunderstorm, August the 1st, 1946. 1946. And we stayed with his sister, Mary, up on Morgan Avenue, mm -hmm. next to the old castle garden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We stayed there with her. Mm -hmm. And then uh, her sister, Anne, was living with the parents. We walked up the hill, like I said, walked up the hill, and I met his parents. And uh, we stayed, like I said, we stayed with Mary then until Ann and Andy moved out of with, with their parents, and then we moved up with his parents, and then we found an apartment in a downstairs basement as you went down the driveway to the old Chalorey Medicine Hospital. Mm -hmm. We stayed there. We stayed there. Uh, until after Christmas of the first year, and then we moved up into an apartment up on the next block, still in lock four. Mm -hmm. And from there, 
that's when his mother took sick, and uh, I was 1948, and that's I was picked to come and take care of her. So I took care of her till she died, February the uh, 12th, 1950. 1950. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 19. She was 59 years of age. Well, we'll be as we get ready to close the interview. I want to ask you: Is there anything that you'd like to say about your military experience in general? What did it? What 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 kind of impact did your military experience have on you? Well, as far as that, I met a lot of nice girls. Uh, I learned, and I got a different outlook, more or less, on you know what the boys had to go through and all that. It was not a pretty sight seeing the fellows coming back because they were coming back with arms missing, legs missing. They were on stretchers. And from answering the questions that the boys were sending in to me, I got a different outlook too because I could tell how their minds were working when they came back. Because I had this one little boy, I felt really bad for him. He would send me the same question, just worded a little bit different, but he would send me the same question every single day. Why am I missing this? Why am I missing this? Why am I missing this? And I tried in every way I could to ease his mind as to what, you know, to explain. And finally I said, I'm sorry, but I cannot understand where you are going with this question because I'm doing my best to answer it for you. Mm -hmm. And his colonel, his off, his commanding officer, come up to talk to my lieutenant Lou Allen was the name of the one that was head of the personnel, and they called me into the office, and he, this man says to me, "Would you answer me a question?" And I said, "If I can." And he said, "Could you tell me why?" you put this answer in this, in this question. And I said, sir, there was never any intention of my hurting the boy. And I, I said, would you excuse me for a minute? So I went, because I had kept the questions. And I went back and I got him the paper and I showed him. I said, he has sent me at least 10 letters with all the same question. I said, I have done my best and every every letter, I tried to explain it a little bit different, thinking that he would get the message. And I said, I never meant in any way to be smart with him. Because what I had said was, I can't understand what you mean by this, or what more do you expect from this. And I said, it was not meant to be smart, because I would never do that to any of the boys. And... Uh, I got the idea that the boy probably was probably about 18, maybe 19. And I said, uh, I just can't understand. I said, here's my answer. And I showed him the different answers that I had put on the questions because I kept a copy of it. And he said, I, he said, I see your point. And he said, I'm sorry if it was they you know, if he understood it different than what it should be. And I said I would apologize to him face to face if I had to. But I said I just cannot figure out why he does not understand what I am trying to explain to him. Right. And he said I'll talk to him. Mm -hmm. And after he, after he talked to him, apparently he explained it to him, you know, differently. Right. So I took it that the boy must have been shell-shocked. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And that's why he didn't understand it. Right. But the majority of them, whenever I sent, you know, whenever I sent the questions into them, the answers into them, they seemed to understand it because they would see me afterwards. Right. And they would say, thank you for, under you know, I see where my mistake was. Right. Because like I said, 
if they lost anything in their uniforms or rifles or anything in their uniform. As far as losing a canteen, that wasn't considered. But if they lost their rifle, which was part of the uniform, or any of their uniform itself. And see, when you were discharged, you were allowed to keep one uniform, one full uniform. Mm -hmm. Because I kept mine, and as a matter of fact, I had it dyed black. And I 